This demonstration is going to illustrate the dissociation of ions in an aqueous solution. We could use this anywhere from solution stoichiometry uh, to ratio of particles, balancing equations. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take two relatively well-known, well-used solids, sodium chloride and calcium chloride. We're going to dissolve them in about 70 milliliters of water and then we're going to see their effect of concentration on the current. This is something that kids don't often get a chance to see. We're going to use a conductivity probe hooked to a LabQuest that's manufactured by Vernier Company. And what that will do is that will give us a quantitative reading of the amount of conductivity that's taking place in our solution. Normally, in most classrooms that, that I see, we can do this on a qualitative basis with the little probes that go in and light up with the red and green lights, and that's a great way to do it. But I think this takes it one step further, puts some numbers along with that conductivity, and gives kids that really, really good sense of how many ions are flying around in solution at that particular point in time. Okay? So I'm going to have Penny help me here today because this is really needs to be done in a two-person two laboratory setting. I'll be the one that's running the lab quest, collecting data as we go, and Penny's going to be helping us by dropping drops of, I have one molar sodium chloride. It's not really solid. We've already made the solution, so I've got a, a one molar solution of sodium chloride and a one molar solution of calcium chloride, and we're going to be dropping those into 70 milliliters of distilled water. When I set my conductivity probes up, it allows me to put in an axis. I've got conductivity along the y-axis. It's measured in microsiemens per centimeter. And then I've got drops of sodium chloride as my label for the x-axis. We want an events with entry, which means that the LabQuest will wait for me to tell it to keep a data point before I type in how many drops I've put in there kind of like pH probes uh, when we're doing the titration. Okay, at this point in time, we're going to get a baseline conductivity on our distilled water. So we'll start that. I want to look at my meter to see where we're at so we have a pretty good idea. We're measuring at about 110 microsiemens per centimeter at this point in time. I'll flash back over and that's what's nice about this. It's very user-friendly that you can go back and forth between the, the screens relatively easily. Okay, as I start the reaction, a keep button comes up here and allows me to keep whatever the probe is reading at this particular point in time. I'm going to press the keep button. That's going to be my zero mark. And if you'll notice, a, a blank comes up there that allows me to put in that I have put in no drops, zero drops, of sodium chloride. I can click OK and it gives me my first data point. Okay, at this time Penny's going to put in one drop of sodium chloride and give the beaker a little swirl. And what I want to do is I'm going to switch back and we're going to see if that has changed. We can come back to that graph and we can watch that change and that should be a little bit higher from where it was before and we want to once that settles out we can keep that data point so we're going to hit keep and we type in the number of drops of sodium chloride that are in there now and at this point in time it is one okay if we put another drop in and give it a swirl and we're just going to continue to do this and we're going to watch that and we see it increasing and this we want to get a keep on that and so now we won't go back to that meter anymore we'll just stay with the graph so that we can get through a couple more drops two drops right right I have two drops in there currently and I click OK OK and let's put a third drop in And swirl. And I will keep that. And I can see up here in the upper right corner, I can see the meter running. And so I can wait till that settles and hit keep. 
And that's my third. And we're going to do one more drop after this, but not yet, please. Then I've got to get that one in there. Okay. And we can see it building a very nice graph. And one more drop, please. And give that a swirl. And so it should be a relatively linear graph. And we'll keep that. And that is a total of four drops of sodium chloride that we have there at that point in time. OK. I'm going to stop this. What I have is a nice linear graph on here. At this point in time, I'm going to walk over to the board, and we're going to take a look at why that slope is the way that it is. When sodium chloride dissociates, it dissociates to Na plus and Cl minus. That gives us a total of two ions per mole of sodium chloride. As we look and compare that to calcium chloride, we're going to notice that the graph for calcium chloride should look significantly different than this graph that we have for the sodium chloride. And so what we can see from this graph is the reason it has the slope that it does is if we take a look at this, with sodium chloride, for every two moles of ions, we get two moles of ions from every one mole of sodium chloride that dissociates in water. And now what we can do is we can take a look at how calcium chloride concentration affects the conductivity in the beaker with a solution that has a dissociation of calcium chloride to Ca2 plus and 2Cl minus. Again, we'll get a baseline reading on our tap water. I have 70 milliliters of tap water, and we're going to drop drops of one molar calcium chloride solution into that. I want to keep it at about 110 microsiemens, and we have put no drops of water in there. The drops of, I'm sorry, we put no drops of calcium chloride. Okay, Penny, if you would put one drop of calcium chloride in. And give it a pretty good swirl. Okay, and now we're going to put two drops in. A second drop. And I'm going to hit the keep on that. So now we have a total of two drops of calcium chloride in there. And we'll go one more drop. Mm -hmm. And that's three. And then a fourth drop. And when the conductivity stabilizes, we hit keep. And we have a fourth drop in there. I would then stop this. I go to my graph, my analyze. I want a curve fit on the conductivity. The type of line I want is linear. And we get a nice line on that from which we could have statistics, and it would put a nice slope on that. The reason that we are going to get more of a slope on the calcium chloride as opposed to the sodium chloride, if we take a look, with the calcium chloride, we get three moles of ions produced 
with each mole, one mole of calcium chloride. That gives us greater slopes. If we look at it on the board for a comparison's sake, if we look at it, if I draw a slope of the sodium chloride, it gives me a certain slope because of the two ions, two moles of ions per mole of solid. If I look at calcium chloride, it gives me a little steeper slope if I'm looking at the number of drops versus the conductivity. Now, I would have my students make a prediction as to what would happen with aluminum chloride. And when aluminum chloride dissociates, it's going to give me four ions for every mole, four moles of ions for every mole of solution. And what I talk about with my students when I do it, we have a hard time getting that aluminum chloride to make the third slope this high. You would predict that aluminum chloride would come out with a greater slope. But what we have found is, as we add the one molar aluminum chloride to this, it actually will taper off and start to diminish with the increasing number of drops. And then I talk to the students about the Van't Hoff factor, where not all of the ions in solution dissociate. They will stay together because of some of the energies that are involved there. And we also talk about the hydrolysis, that the aluminum ion, because of its high charge density with a 3 plus, may attract or hydrolyze with the water. And so you can have this as a nice way to quantify conductivity of solutions based on their dissociation. Thank you.